The following interview was conducted with Horace S. Tyler, Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Communications for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, November 20th, 2009, at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Tyler. Good Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born on a farm in uh, Gilboa Township in Benton County, about uh, five miles from Remington in uh, 1923. Okay. Seems like only yesterday. I know. <laughs> what month was that? Hmm? What month were you born in? September. Okay. The 14th. Okay. Hey, that's my brother's birthday. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Different you. year, though. <laughs> Tell us all about your parents. Do you have any siblings in oh, yeah. early school my years? Mom and dad were born in 1881. Father was born in uh, on a farm near Plainfield, Illinois, in the northeastern part of the state, southwest of Chicago. And my mother was born on the farm in Remington on what's now Highway 24. And um, somehow I grew up without being stepped on by a cow or <laughs> any other animals. <laughs> and uh, we lived what, was gra- what was grade school like? Was it close by? Uh, Kilboa Township School, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was in the northwest corner of the township, so that was six miles. That was about as far as away as you could get from the school. And uh, I attended there until I was mid-year sophomore in high school. And then we moved a couple of miles north into Jasper County and I went to uh, and graduated from Remington High School in 1941. Okay. And after high school, then what came next? Oh, I... The war is well, getting... Well, I, I, not right away in, in uh, spring or summer of uh, 41, I worked... Uh, as a cook's helper at uh, Culver Military Academy. At Culver, up in Indiana. northern Indiana? Yeah, yeah, I peeled potatoes and a few other sundry things like that. And um, my brother was working in a bank in uh, Miami, Florida, and he had always wanted to help me go to Purdue, someplace he was able to attend one year and ran out of money, but so he hitchhiked to Miami and got a job in a bank down there. And uh, one day he was talking to one of the clients and uh, discussing his little brother. And uh, she said, oh, hey, uh, if he wants to get a college education, then maybe he can get a job in Washington, D.C. And uh, she gave him a, an application to work for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So he sent it to me, and I filled it out and sent it in. The day after I was 18, I got a telegram saying uh, come to uh, Washington and uh, be um, what was it uh, work work in the mechanical plant at the FBI there in uh, Washington Street in uh, Washington uh, between 9th and 10th on Pennsylvania Avenue that's the big house and um, so I toddled on in there about, this was in November that this finally came about. And I got there um, Did you take, week, the, take week. the train, I imagine? Oh, mm-hmm. by all means, yeah. My folks drove me to Logansport to catch the train and went into Washington on the, sure. on the train. And um, one of the interesting sidelights, at least to me, uh, went to church the first Sunday I was there in town and I just looked on the map and found one nearby and it was Foundry Methodist Church on uh, North 16th Street or 16th Street Northwest and uh, the choir director was there and he heard me sing so he invited me to come and join the choir which I did and uh, a couple weeks later Pearl Harbor happened and I'll never forget that weekend, uh, a friend I had met in the Bureau in the FBI was from Indianapolis, and so we palled around a little bit. He had a car and was showing me the sights. And on the Saturday night before December 7th, we were on a hill up above Arlington, Virginia, uh, looking down at the Capitol, 
and it was just bathed in white. It was really a beautiful looking mm-hmm. scene. Mm-hmm. Next day was December 7th, and things changed immediately in Washington. It went from bright light to muzzled <laughs> darkness virtually. Yeah, how, just overnight. Explain how did uh, make a, uh, they just cut back on? They just shut off the lights, yeah, and immediately installed lights that only showed on the bottom uh, and didn't put up very much light at the top. Wow. That was That's interesting. pretty interesting, yeah. It sure is, yeah. And um, soon after that, I think about the 20th of December, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill came to that church, attended that church, so I was fortunate to be in the choir. Were you there the, at that in time? In the choir at that time, yeah. Okay. About two weeks before uh, they were coming, we were told about it and that there would be no more people admitted to the choir until after that was over. <laughs> so I suppose we all had been enumerated. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Since I was working for the FBI at the time, I may have gotten a clean sure. bill. <laughs> yeah. And what so, sort of work were you doing for the FBI? Well, I did clerical work. Okay. Yeah. I was assigned to the uh, photographic department for some reason. They needed a clerk. And uh, so, yeah, I worked in there and checked in the evidence, and it was photographed, and then I'd check it out and put the pictures in the files or send them whatever mm-hmm. they want. So that was kind of an interesting job. Yes. I was on the seventh floor of the Department of Justice building okay. Okay. at that time. Did, how did the atmosphere change in Washington after the war started? Oh, it turned off the lights. Yeah, that's I how, know. <laughs> that's and how then, quickly it changed. And then, of course, rationing came in sometime after that, yeah, didn't it? Well, yeah. I don't remember. I, I didn't yeah. have a car, so I yeah. was not particularly affected by rationing. And the, the transit system in Washington, D.C. was just excellent with streetcars and uh, buses that traveled all over around. the district. Sure. and So easy access. Did you actually live in the district as well? Yeah, I oh. lived on the north... Uh, West 16th Street, about eight blocks north of the oh, White that was House. Good. So, if yeah. nice weather, you could really walk. That's not bad. I did walk, yeah. Sure. Uh, it was 10 or 11 blocks from there to 10th and Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And then what uh, What came next? Uh, did, you ha- did you have to enter the service then, or was yeah. that what came next? I uh, worked at the Bureau until um, I got my draft notice on New Year's Eve, 1942. So Happy I, New Year to you. Yeah, I will be. So uh, <clears throat> I got an interview with J. Edgar Hoover. Can you imagine him talking to a clerk? How anyway, did that, how did that well, come I just up? wrote a little note and said I'd like to see him before I went in the service. I'd just been drafted, hoping he would say, my son, you're indispensable. We need you here. <laughs> no dice. Well, it will make you 4F, right? <laughs> no, no dice. No, it will make you indispensable. Yeah. No dice. He yeah. just stood up and congratulated me and says, my boy, when you come back, you'll have a job here. And that was the end of the interview. God be with you, right? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe the earth to open you got, up. And you know, nothing ventured, nothing no. gained, you know. <laughs> I never even brought up the fact that I was hoping I might be deferred. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so on. The, then what, uh, where, would, where did you, what base were you at first or where did you go? Well, let's see. Did yeah, you let's get a chance to come home before you? Yeah, I had, oh. a, I had about a week and I, okay. that was the last week in January and uh, so I spent that at home and went back to Washington and uh, was inducted at Fort Myers, Virginia and sent from there immediately down to Camp Pickett, Virginia which is in the hills in southern Virginia and found myself in the medical department who knows what kind of assignments you're going to get in the army so I learned how to be a medical soldier, and uh, about that time, ASTP, the Army Specialized Training Program, was in effect, and 22 of us were held back after the in our initial training period, and we all thought, well, we're going to go to college someplace. Well, uh, another 10 or 12 weeks passed, and we hadn't gone to college, and the program was canceled. So uh, 
We did got, did the program would have been, would that have been would have included college? They yeah, were sent yeah, you. Okay. There were, yeah, there were a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Navy, they had those B five and B twelve. And the B twelve. That's right. Yeah. In which there were some here at yeah, Purdue. Yeah. And uh, so we were sent to Camp Carson, Colorado. Eventually, we had a really nice first class train ride. And uh, when we stopped in Chicago to make a change, well, I was able to call my parents and talk to them on the telephone. No, that was nice. Well, yeah. Unable to get down to see them, of course, but sure. was called in passing through. <laughs> and uh, well, actually, we went to Camp Hale first, which is a, and we thought uh, that was a ski training center for uh, troops. And I was there about five days, and the unit that I'd been assigned to had been sent down to Colorado Springs to Camp Carson. So went down there in a truck convoy, and spent uh, the rest of the summer there until, um, oh, when was it? It was, a, I was about to get on the bus one Saturday night to go up and see an aunt and uncle in Fort Collins or Loveland, Colorado. And as I, a buddy and I got on the bus, uh, MPs got in and said, oh, you guys from the 13th, they got to get off. <laughs> so, uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> and so we got off, and 10 days later, we were on the shipboard heading for India. So we spent 46. That's a long <laughs> trip. Yeah, it was. We were on a converted Italian luxury liner. <laughs> had beautiful paintings on the ceiling, but the bunks were stacked up four or five high. And I found myself on the top bunk with a light Did enclosed in an iron cage <laughs> so that you, of course, wouldn't break out the light if you right. cracked it by sitting up suddenly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we t that took uh, about 46 days to go from L.A. to uh, to Bombay. Uh, en route, we stopped at Bora Bora, and uh, I think we had an engine repair, and we laid up there for about a week. Could you get off the ship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that made, they, that made they, it nice. They, they finally let us off when the natives got so restless they weren't sure they could contain 8,000 uh, 8, troops with <laughs> let them go. with, with, yeah. a, with 150 <laughs> MPs on board. And yeah, we were allowed to go sure. to swimming parties. Yeah, and um, then we kept zigzagging down and went around New Zealand, someplace, and came up on the bottom side of uh, Australia to uh, Fremantle. The big city there is Perth, P-E-R-T-H. Mm -hmm. And we were there a few days and then continued on. This time we were accompanied by. Uh, uh, couple of destroyers, something French or Dutch or something up to uh, Bombay. Had uh, about a had 14 or 15 day train ride across India. Takes a long time when they stop every 50 miles for tea, which was the, the case. <laughs> the traditions die slowly. <laughs> yeah, there would always be a squad of Gurkhas when we'd stop and uh, they'd have a huge 55-gallon drum full of uh, tea, tea with, uh, that had already been sugared and milked or creamed. Sure. And uh, you knew it was bona fide authentic sugar because there'd be little fragments of burlap sack floating in it that <laughs> came <laughs> off the sugar bags. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting too much detail here, I know, but that's stuff that comes that's to good. mind. That's good. Yeah, that's fine. And... Uh, Lots of traveling, oh my God! Yeah, All the way. Yeah. Oh, you mean? Yeah, we, yeah, we had 14 days on the plane on the train, and uh, wow, uh, two days and a night on a river boat on the Brahmaputra that took us pretty close to Lido, Assam, uh, and we finished the last part. I think it was either by truck or narrow gauge train. So that's how we got to China Burma India Theater and. Uh, after I was there for oh, two or three weeks, two other fellows and I were assigned to the 20th General Hospital 
to learn uh, laboratory work. So we learned blood lab, uh, blood lab and uh, urinalysis and stool examinations. And we learned a lot. We got a college education Damn to right. some degree in, a, in eight weeks' time. Then we were sent back to our units. And, sure. Uh, part of our group worked with, uh, were in training with Gordon Seagraves. You've heard of the Burma surgeon? Gordon Seagraves. Right. He had Burmese nurses with him, and uh, so he trained a lot of our people, took them on flank movements and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, I didn't go on any of those with Seagrave, but many of the guys in our outfit did. There's no host hostilities around there, was there? No any what? fighting or anything of that sort? Any hostilities around uh, in that on yeah, the border? There was, was there? There were a lot of hostilities. Oh, were there? Okay. Because yeah. <laughs> the war was in Europe at that time, even yeah. though it was in, by that time, you know, I, yeah. also in Japan and mm -hmm. against Japan. Yeah. Well, we were uh, supporting mostly Chinese army while okay. we were there. And, um, are the Flying Tigers over? Th would it be over there too? Oh yeah, they okay. were there at that time. Sure, but they okay. were in China. Sure, and right. We were, and we were in Burma. Right. Yeah. Northern, right. Northern Burma. So yeah, I was in two campaigns: Northern Burma and Central Burma over about a sixteen-month period. Mm-hmm. And you still kept on in the medical. It's like a medical corpsman. You were still in the medical division. Oh yeah, the whole I, time. We had uh, what amounted to a. Our company was divided into three platoons, and each one uh, represented a, a kind of a surgical, portable surgical unit. Right, okay. And we'd put up tents and put up a couple of, ba uh, put up four bamboo poles with a notch in them so that there was space just so you could put a litter. So if someone comes in on a litter, you just pick it up and put it on, and you don't have to roll them around an right, awful lot. Right, okay. And uh, I'll never forget the first time I was asked to give an anesthetic. A uh, soldier came in with a kind of a bad wound in his shoulder and uh, the surgeon says, uh, well, I think I'll use pentothal. I'd never heard of it. I put a dog to sleep with ether back in Camp Carson, but pentothal, okay, well, how do I use it? Well, you stick the needle in this <laughs> jar and <laughs> pull out a tube full of red stuff. I says, how much shall I give him? And he says, well, I don't know. Let's start with five cc's. See, <laughs> so oh. we were both learning on the job. <laughs> <laughs> that, the researchers will love that. Wow. <laughs> don't try it on me, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyhow, <laughs> it eventually worked. the guy went to sleep. And <laughs> we'd pumped so much into him. By that time, he didn't wake up for six hours after. <laughs> but at least he did wake up. That's important. That's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's the end result, right? <laughs> Bring you back to that's, life. <laughs> yes. <that's laughs> so... Yeah, those are just so many little incidents that come back to me about that. But uh, I guess it's memorable, or I wouldn't sure. think of it. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Were you stationed there the most of the time that you were in the we service? We traveled all the way across uh, Burma, uh, living in tents, or uh, now it's called Myanmar. 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 Yeah, Myanmar. yeah oh. right. Yeah, we were, and in the northern and central campaigns, those two campaigns, uh, that's uh, just. Largely um, unsettled country. It was just simply oh, I bet. jungles and yeah. trails. And uh, the uh, American engineers built that road across. They had machine guns on their bulldozers and occasionally had to use them. But we followed that, uh, yeah. fi followed the bulldozers to the, as the road was built. Uh -huh. We also went on what they called flank movements. Uh, the main force of the Chinese was being pushed down that road as it was being built, and uh, side uh, on on the sides, both bo either flank, uh, they would have units of maybe a regiment or maybe even a division that would take a big side swipe down to uh, either try to cut the lines or to maintain what they had already established. And so I went on a couple of those flank trips. We walked. <laughs> First one, nothing happened. We didn't encounter anybody, but we had a lot of rain. We have two monsoons in that area every year. 
That's awful and stuff. It's a lot of rain. I can't oh, describe yeah. it any more than that. Um, it didn't rain all the time. You'd have sunshine and then uh, through the middle of the day, and then you'd have showers at night. And sometimes it'd last all night, and sometimes for several days. But yeah. uh, when in the monsoon season is this yeah. the season, right? Yeah. yeah, there were two of them. Yeah, yeah. big one and little one. Uh, they both seemed plenty lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> big and little didn't really. It's like two or three days of rain around here. Oh my God, is it still raining? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a, a three, my, one of my nephews, and when he was three years old, he was staying with us, and it was raining quite a bit, and I put him down for a nap, and then we used to say, and Katie, is it still raining? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael, it is still raining. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. Yeah. And we, um, our units uh, supported all kinds of troops, uh, Chinese. Uh, there were two American um, combat units went over there, uh, Merrill's Marauders, and we supported them. We uh, Okay. evacuated a number of them and then there was another group called Mars Task Force each of them was amounted to about a brigade maybe 3,000 soldiers involved and uh, they had pretty hard life and uh, let's see the Chinese troops uh, Merrill's Marauders and there were a lot of British troops down there of course that was their that's their territory they, they were defending right. their own protectorate right, right. And uh, so there were all kinds of troops. We had uh, West Africans and uh, uh, Scottish. One morning, I'll never forget it, but I awaken and hear the bagpipes are playing and a unit just toddling down this <laughs> dirt trail playing bagpipes <laughs> as they... Uh, I gave a little touch. <laughs> it it uh, yeah, stirred your blood to hear that. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. It does even the few times I've heard it over the years, <laughs> being someplace. And uh, G General Wingate with the British Arm Armed Forces uh, uh, was a great believer in long-range penetration, so they flew a lot of troops um, over the jungles, and they landed on uh, some places that were cleared out as airstrips, but they were in gliders, so there was no return. And... Uh, those guys had to walk their way out and fight their way out, and uh, they had some pretty heavy engagements. So we were, we were patching up Allied troops of all shapes and colors. Right. And yeah. Was it a pretty good sized facility? Where the medical facility? I mean, well, most facility tents. was a tent. Tents, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> air, acreage wise, I mean, there was quite oh. a. Oh, I don't know. Um, well, if you had, had a tent, would be what? 20 by sure, 30, right. something max. That's a right. big tent. To yeah, put up. that's right. And yeah. yeah, we moved those on. We had uh, what they call six by six trucks. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's mm -hmm. a six wheel truck with sure. all wheel drive or front wheel drive as well. Yeah, in our in our company with three platoons, uh, each platoon had two or three of those six by sixes. And they could move either supplies or troops, and we rode in those wherever the road. If there was a road, well, we that we could you travel on, huh? Yeah. yeah well, we traveled probably a thousand or twelve hundred miles across northern Burma, at least yeah. that much, because a lot of jungles and a lot of hills, a lot of detours to take, and the road was being built as we went along. Right. Yeah. So that's Most of your service was spent over there, and then, then when when did you get out of the service? When the war was over, or before? Yeah, well, our our campaign finished up. The Chinese came to the China border and went across there, and so we just went to kind of hibernation until because sure. <laughs> the campaign was over. Right, the, I understand. The Japanese had been obliterated. Not a pretty sight, but right. Um, yeah, then we were in in camp. Um, our unit was disbanded, and we were reassigned various places. I went from the 13th Mountain Medical Battalion to the 12th. What was it? It was a, more of a permanent installation. They they'd been in Lido, Assam since 1942 sometime. 
Mm -hmm. So we were there until they finally put us in the train and sent us home. We arrived back in the States, I think it was the 3rd of December of uh, 45. Okay, yeah. after the war was over. Yeah. Then but what What did you do after that now? Tell us. Well, is that when you took the GI Bill and came okay. to Purdue. Yeah. How did you happen to select Purdue? Well, I'm a native of Indiana, and uh, well, yeah. I figured I'd been away from home long enough for one thing. Okay, and you're interested in the program here, right? Well, I, agriculture. I, it, that was uh, something that came to mind, anyhow, when sure. I, I had studied at uh, George Washington University, just taking a liberal arts course when I was working at the FBI. Sure. I to go uh, after work. I went during three semesters and took, oh, maybe four. Uh, three to six hours each term. I got off work at the FBI at 3.30 in the afternoon, and so that gave me a chance to either walk or take the streetcar to George Washington mm -hmm. University, which was only about 10 blocks or so from the uh, Justice Department. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that was good, uh, utilizing the resources yeah. in, your, in the city, you know, yeah. and the yeah. academic. Yeah. yeah, I think tuition was $20 an hour, so... <laughs> And I was well, making hundred and twenty dollars a month, so that Purdue's tradition uh, t tuition was, you know, the fees were very, you know, very low. Oh yeah, was, you know, and, and sometimes when people g give that to me in the interview, I say we have to put it in that in the perspective of that time, the consensus perspective of that time. I had won a four H scholarship to Purdue back in nineteen forty one, and it paid thirty dollars a semester, uh, but I didn't have enough money to. To sure. do that, yeah. <laughs> and that's why my brother had dropped out after his freshman year. Because sure. So you came to Purdue. And where Where did you live when you came? Did you live in one of the dorms? No, I uh, lived in fraternity house. I joined the fraternity when I was at George Washington University. Okay. Talk Kappa Epsilon, and um, I just walked in cold turkey to the teak house at two thirteen Russell Street here in West Lafayette, and looking for bodies to <laughs> so they worked out for you oh yeah yeah was. tell us a little about the campus and your campus life and your program when you were here at Purdue oh I was in I took agricultural economics and um, did all did very well in in science I did better in science courses than I did in economics but uh, that was my major and mm -hmm. uh, I was in the Purdue Lee Club for Six semesters, I think it was. Very five, nice. five or six semesters. They had the Christmas show, of course, at that oh, time, yeah, too, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the performances were over in Elliott Hall of Music, because Elliott Hall of Music was built in 41. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 40, 41. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, were most of your classes would have been in the Ag Administration? Ag. Uh, ag no, 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 no. What's now the classes in the Ag Administration? Okay. Building. That was known as the Agricultural Experiment Station building at that oh, time. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. And then but what's that's where known my as office was. was okay, it? that's what's known as Fendler Hall now. That was Fendler was, was in, in Ag Hall, Agricultural Hall. Okay, yeah. okay. And it's got a different name now too. Okay, okay. But, um, I had a lot of classes in old Ag Hall. Mm -hmm. Was Earl, was Earl Butts here at that when you were here? Yeah. Earl Butts. Okay. Yeah, he was department head when I. Oh, right it, egg, yeah. he was in egg, uh, egg, egg economics. Uh, economics, yeah. right? Okay. And, uh, and must Dave Fenner was, was he here at that time oh, too? Oh yeah, Dave was here. Okay. Well, that's good. And Vern Freeman was okay. the academic. I met. Um, I have a fact fellow in Tarkington, and Vern was a fact fellow in Tarkington, uh -huh. and so he used to come to some of they used to have the Winter Whispers and things. So I got a chance to mm -hmm. to meet him, and uh, really nice person. Yeah. And he also used to take these trips, and he took one down to one of the islands, and they have like the Mayan things, and you climb up all these steps. Oh, oh and okay. he sent a postcard. And I did do it, in and South I thought America. to myself, yeah, yeah, right. I said, "That's great, Vern, but yeah. not me." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of uh, traveling and yeah. things. Yes. And then yeah. you, f uh, after you finished, what uh, what came next then? Well, I needed a job. I applied to a. Insurance company as a farm manager out in Iowa, and that did not turn out to be productive. I 
didn't get any offer to work there, and I applied for a job with the Illinois Central Railroad, and that didn't amount to uh, didn't amount to a job. And I got a letter before I graduated from the Cooperative Extension Service. Roy Hoffman was the director and sent some literature along with it. And so I said, hey, I can, I can do that. <laughs> so I uh, went to Gibson County as a 4-H agent and a youth leader and agricultural agent, agri okay. assistant agricultural agent. Yeah, that was... Uh, an interesting turn in my life. I, uh, we hired a new secretary one day, and we'd been married ever since 1951. So, <laughs> very nice. That's very nice. And you're the class of 1950. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you got the the well, that, hall. And I graduated in uh, January of 1950. Okay. Okay. Right. For the researchers, there's a building on campus called the, the class of 1950. Yeah. Well, it's very nice. Yeah. I'm just. Um, People listening to this so they understand. We put uh, a few bucks in that. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> very nice. It's a very, very nice building of researchers. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We should be very proud, and they kept that name, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, that was a good idea. All right. Then after, the, go ahead and then tell yeah. us about your career here at Purdue. And well, when you came I was back, an assistant county agent for a year, and uh, one day I got a call from Roy Hoffman, who was the director of the Extension Service, and uh, he says, uh, why don't you come up and do the radio job, farm radio job in the Extension Service. Well, I'd been on the radio a little bit down in southern Indiana on two or three stations down there. Sure. In our, they had what they call the Pocket Neighbors program down there. It, it was a, on the Evansville station, WGBF, I think it was, yeah. And then Princeton, Indiana, where I was living, um, started a new radio station, and so I was on that. So I'd had a little bit of experience, but nothing really qualifying me. But they asked me to come up and do that, so that's what I did. <laughs> well, tell us a little, what did that involve? Was it, uh, for the research, was it a weekly program, or? Oh, well, um, was this over WBAA? No, well, this, well, yeah, that oh. was involved in it too. Okay, but this was this is the statewide program where you service radio stations all over the Indiana and the Midwest as well as okay. WBAA. And I, I had a daily program on WBAA called the Farm Forum. And okay, it had been going for a good many years before I got there, so I just kept on doing what they were doing, and I did that for I think twenty seven years. Was time. that on a weekly basis? Is that when the program Daily, would be? Yeah. Daily. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Including Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that cuts yeah. into the sports activities. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had student help with that, and uh, they where 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 was it located? Where did you do your broadcasting from? Uh, Ag Experiment Station Building, AES Building. What do they call that now? The, Egg administration building. Okay, okay. You know, okay. Second okay. floor. They had a had a remote microphone in there and pop in and a red light would come on at twelve noon and I'd hear them playing the theme and <laughs> You're on. <laughs> yeah. People are going, You're Good on. afternoon, friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, Made the Did you ever meet uh, Johnny DeCamp at all? Oh, doing very well, yeah. Okay. In fact, he was our two doors down neighbor. He built, after we moved out here, well, he Is that said, right? hey, that looks like a good place to live, so he bought a couple acres uh, there. I've met him, you know, I've oh, met him yeah. a few times, and he's very, very nice, yeah, you know. Yeah. I've, no, I've met neighbors. his wife, too. Yeah, that's nice, yeah. Um. The ex you were an extension specialist. Is that what would be with yeah, that farm yeah. farm? And well, the, the agricultural radio job. Okay, that's what that okay. amounted to. And then you mentioned you were an assistant to a department head, or why don't you tell us a little? And then they changed oh. it to agriculture communication service. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ralph Reeder was the director of the agricultural information office when I came here, and uh, I. Worked here, oh, let's say until 1953, I guess it was, mm -hmm. and um, did radio programs and 
made tape recordings that were distributed throughout the state. And um, in 53, um, there was something called the National Project in Agricultural Communications that had been funded by Kellogg up at Michigan State University. And Ralph Reeder, my department head, and I, and uh, oh, I can't think of a lady's name from Home Economics, and Einer Ryden uh, was a member of the psychology department at Purdue, and he had been uh, set up to uh, uh, offer courses that would lead to a master's degree for extension workers, counter for agricultural yeah, extension. At Michigan State? Uh, no, here. Oh, at, here. here okay. Purdue. And the four of us uh, went up to uh, East Lansing and had... I think it was what a three-week seminar um, that dealt with sociology, psychology, and all the components of communication, which was an eye-opener to a lot of long-time <laughs> radio, TV, and publications people. And uh, you know that was a that was a good gate-opening experience for all of us that attended, and it was opened up eventually. They were able to conduct that uh, so that extension information specialists or experiment station information specialists uh, from all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. were, had some exposure to it. We put on programs based on that information in uh, all of the counties through county through, through throughout districts. Throughout the state? Huh? Yeah, throughout mm -hmm. the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. And yeah, that was uh, that uh, kind of revolutionized and uh, gave a spark to all the agricultural communication people from Washington D.C. all across the country to get advanced degrees and just took off from there. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Very nice. So. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> what about the? Uh, was there any national 4-H congresses? Did you go to oh, some yeah, of those? Went to yeah, from the time I moved up here to do the radio stuff, um, went to a National 4-H Club Congress to uh, line up um, Indiana 4-H delegates with various news media people mm -hmm. for okay. either broadcast or press coverage. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. I worked on the national committee two or three different years. Okay. That's good. Doing okay. that. When the local F, uh, 4-H was here, were you in, did you were you involved in any of the, the programs that they have with the local 4-H? They used to have their they have meetings here. No, not so much. Not, okay. No. Okay. Just with 4-H people were on the programs sure. that I you know, some interact programs with. I right. Produced, yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay. What about the administration? Something you were, you were department head. You want to talk a little no, bit about that? No, I was that? never department head. I was acting. Okay. Off and on for. About twenty years when. <laughs> well, that's okay. What were some of the re, um, oh, response? Well, Tell Ralph Reeder, my department head, uh, uh, took a year sabbatic to go to graduate school in Michigan State University, and so he asked me to serve sure. as acting department head during that time. And uh, then off and on, he had had assignments, and uh, Ed Faringer. Uh, companion of mine who was also in uh, Ag Information, later became head of information, and mm -hmm. after he suffered some illness, why well, I was asked to serve as acting department head while he recovered. So, you know, but that was, those sort things of were sporadic right, over sure. about a 20-year period. Yeah, that's very yeah. good. Yeah, keeps things moving along. Well, yeah, I guess <laughs> nothing, nothing. I think I'm doing it right. Nothing totally <laughs> stalled. <laughs> uh, uh, let's talk a little how about the Ag Alumni Association. You're involved with that as the office and president and vice president. Yeah, well, I'm, I got involved in that really very early, but uh, that was because you were an that, Ag alum. That, that was that was through the. Ag cor the Ag Four, a quartet, barbershop quartet. Um, Clark Stevenson, the head of horticulture, and uh, uh, Herb Kramer from the agronomy department, and um, John Osmond from the entomology department. We 
were known as the Ag Four, and we sang at an awful lot of Ag alumni meetings all oh, over super. the state. So. And also at the uh, uh, the fish fry too. Oh yeah, we did some there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your modesty. Oh, <laughs> Your no, modesty. No. <laughs> uh, Those were fun things. Yeah. Where did in the early days, maybe in the where did they used to hold it? Was it always in the armory? Yeah, it was oh, in. Yeah. Um, uh, the first uh, two or three that I attended uh -huh. back in uh, 50, 51, 52 were in the Agricultural Engineering Building. There was a big open space machine shed, I think it was, or something, and we held. That's okay. where it was to begin with. Then we then we moved to the armory. Okay. Um, and the size of the group would increase over time? Oh, or? yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, more graduates kept happening. More people were attending. Yeah, the GI Bill put a lot of a lot of eggs through college. Sure, yeah. right. And they had the now they they had the fish the fish for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they used to have real good fish. Uh, oh, Biddle, from having a metal block. That's okay. Bill Biddle's can. dad. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was a big number in the Ag alumni at that time, and uh, <coughs> he and my cousin Don Tyler used to go up into Wisconsin or Canada, and they'd catch a lot of real good fish, walleye, and so we had walleye for a long time. That's pretty good. Huh? I've oh, never yeah. had that. Well, oh yeah, they were excellent. And uh, where did the, where was the cooking done? Was the cooking done on the spot? Right there. Yeah, it was just outside the armory. Okay. When, yeah. Or just outside the Ag Engineering Building. All right. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll have to take advantage, but now it's all indoors <laughs> or whatever. It's changed a lot. And you had, and and also I remember when I came, there used to be some programs, the winter programs, winter programs in agriculture, mm -hmm. and then sometimes be tied in like the week before the fish fry. Yeah. Well, the winter agricultural short courses had been going a long, long time. My dad attended one back in 1902, mm -hmm. okay. and they were going long before that. Mm -hmm. and but don't they know, don't have I don't know where they've been. Dis I think they probably have been discontinued now, but I'm not yeah. sure. I, you don't hear as much about them no, as before. And, of course, now recently. researchers, the fish fry has been moved to Indianapolis, and you have yeah. a well, featured speaker now, don't you? The, pro the format has changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, how about some awards and honors? Do you want to uh, share some things with us? Mm. Uh, well, you I'm got the uh, Cooperative Extension Service, the Career Award for Excellence. Oh, that was one you got. Yeah, well, that was and nice. the Pioneer Award. Yeah, well, that was through the Ag College Editors Association. Yeah, well, that's very nice. Uh, yeah, it, that was for people who were 35 and under. And <laughs> I was on the borderline. I was exactly <laughs> 35. <laughs> I uh, thought that was, it was, rather, yeah, it was unexpected. Right. I didn't know it was coming, but uh, we went to the National um, Ag College Editors Meeting at uh, Florida, Gainesville, yeah, and, and they received that, that award. There. And they surprised yeah. you. Huh? Well, yeah. yeah that's kind of nice. I thought that was nice. I do, too. I like surprises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about professional associations? You're still, you're still um, the Association for Communication Excellence. That was you were a member of. That? Yeah, I'm a life member of that. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the yeah. alumni association too. Yeah. Make yeah. alumni you keep yeah. active in that. Uh, so let's talk a little about family. You you talk where you met your wife. You have chi you have children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I met uh, Pauline Park in, in Gibson County when I was there. She was signed on as secretary to the. Um, extension service, county extension service, and uh, we were married in September 1951. Uh, in 1953, our daughter was born, Debbie Tyler Tutak, and uh, in 19 on Christmas Day of 1957, our son Bam was born, and uh, on in March 6th. Of 59, Tom, our third child, was born. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom lives in Hawaii with his family now. And Dan Did your children come to Purdue? They go to Purdue? Yeah, the, um, yeah all okay. three of our kids are okay. uh, Purdue grads. What does your son do that lives in Hawaii? That's he, a good place to go when it's cold. Yeah, well, he's an industrial engineer at Pearl Harbor Navy Shipyard. Did he get his IE degree from Purdue? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, our son Dan in uh, Richland, Washington, has a uh, environmental science consulting firm. That uh, he worked for a good number of years at Hanford. You've heard of Hanford, the place where they developed the A bomb. Right. Yeah. And, right. And he worked in some of the environmental cleanup areas there for about seven years. And uh, he has two children, a boy and a girl. His, their son is a junior at the uh, University of Washington, Seattle, and their daughter is a sophomore here at Purdue in biomedical engineering. So Very nice. So you yeah. get to see, they keep in touch. That's yeah. very nice. Yeah. And their son and his wife, Kathy, in Hawaii, have two daughters. Uh, one of them is 14 in high school, and the other one is 12 in junior high. Good. And the youngest one says she wants to come to Purdue and be a veterinarian. So Sounds good. Take care of the animals, <laughs> yeah. right? I'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what's, what's your son's name that lives in Hawaii? That's the one who got his degree. Thomas. Thomas, okay. Thomas yeah. B. Okay. Tyler, Tom Tyler. And then Dan was the one that's in Washington. Dan is in Washington, right. yeah. And where does your daughter live? She lives here in West Lafayette. She's oh. employed at Purdue. And okay. Her, she and her husband's son is a Purdue graduate in the aviation program, and he's now... Is he flying the planes? Is yes, he's yeah. flying in Saudi Arabia. So. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> 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 he works for a special kind of an airline, or... Was it the Saudi Airlines? Aramco. What? Aramco. Aramco. He's with Aramco. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. He's well over there. Yeah. Well, he's um, recently married, and they've got a little daughter. They, does he live over there, too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, Have you visited him there? Not in Saudi, no. Oh, okay. Uh, it's probably changed a lot over the, over time. You read in the paper where they're, they're building and expanding, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty. Does he get back to the States, though? Does he oh, come yeah, here? he gets back here probably about every six months or so. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, his w uh, wife and their daughter are going to be in the stateside here in another week or so, for, but they'll be in, uh, in the North Carolina area oh, most okay. of the time, yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what, how about your retirement activities. What if, is there any special things that you've been doing? Do you do any traveling mm -hmm. or...? Yeah, we did a little traveling. We had a, a German exchange student that lived with us for a year and spent a senior year in high school here uh -huh. with us. And our oldest son was in, was senior at uh, Harrison also. And Tom, the next, was a junior. So the three boys palled around and got along well. And um, he, after his year was up, he went back to uh, Germany and uh, eventually uh, became an MD. He's a pediatrician. In, Over in Germany? In, in Germany, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. And he's been back here to visit us oh, well, that's at nice least keep once. In touch. Yeah. 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 That's very nice. And uh, brought his family with him. And his kids, have both of his, both his children, have uh, stayed with us at one time or another. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and they've also been to Hawaii to visit our son Tom and his family. <laughs> so. um, do you have a, a, a Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Tradition? Tradition, anything special like commencement or the Boilermaker special? Oh, Remember they, our homecoming years ago when they used to have those displays, you know, outside? Yeah, yeah. At the fraternity house, we, met, we built them. Sure. All the time. And they got the, used to get those awards for yeah. $25 or something. They'd announce them at the game, yeah. you know. <laughs> Big deal, 25 bucks. I know. For but all they, those listen, man they, hours did, <laughs> they did pretty well for that. There's a lot of work in there. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have an outstanding event? I'm sorry. What? Outstanding event? that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Mm. Maybe when you met your family? I, well, I think you're yeah. all my all my events are <laughs> started uh, then, right. We're very have been very pleasant and yeah. productive and uh, um, I'm going to leave the final things if you any summary or anything that I didn't ask that you'd like to share with us. <clears throat> I've told you just about everything I can think of. <laughs> 
and more than I had planned on, probably. Sounds, it's good. Yeah. My wife's making a motion. Do you want like a drink of something? Would you like tea or a coffee? Or? Tea? Um, what kind? Hot tea. Hot tea. Would Are you, you like going to join us? Constant, sure. okay, yeah, constant comment. You like that? That would be fine, yes. Oh, okay. It would be lovely, yeah. yes. Um, so you, anything special? We're going to have tea now, right? Yeah. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. This has been very, very uh, nice. I appreciate that. Happy, <coughs> to, happy to be reminded. <laughs> uh.